my name is Dan. Uh, I'm a Microsoft 365 and SharePoint consultant at uh, Evobis. We're a small company in Denmark specializing in uh, helping businesses implement Microsoft 365 and SharePoint. Just a few quick notes on why I made this demo. There's been a change in the PNP PowerShell, uh, the latest version where we're now using app-only authentication. And when you apply a remote event receiver using app-only uh, authentication, we experienced that it doesn't actually execute the remote event receiver. It turns out that you need a app-only principle to do that. And sometimes that's just not convenient when you just need to really quickly apply a remote event receiver. So I figured, well, if we're using user authentication, it actually works. So can we do this through REST? Um, I couldn't find any documentation on whether the SP REST endpoint supported it. So I figured might as well just try. And I went ahead and tried and it worked. Um, so, so that's the use case for this demo or sample. Then I'm just going to be talking about what is a remote event receiver and when to use one and when to use Power Automate. So if we just pull in here, the this is the demo of the web part. So it's really simple. All it does is it lists the lists you have on your site. Um, so you can see we have this one here called you can't create items here, which is just just a list. Um, and I've added a remote event receiver called PNP sample block create, which really all it does is it's a synchronous remote event receiver that just tells you you can't create the item here. So what we will see is we get a custom error message. So it, it says PNP is awesome and so are remote event receivers. Uh, these, these messages can actually be customized because remote event receivers, uh, it's just a SOAP protocol so you can return really any message you want. Um, and I'll get to why that's really awesome in just a minute. Um, we can also do them asynchronous so that you can uh, add something and then remotely there's a server doing some work and it can fill out a field. So this one just clones the title into title cloned, but you could potentially be doing other things there. Uh, what the sample allows you to do is just get a quick overview of these. Uh, you can see it's there, you can delete it, or you can add a new one. Uh, so, so it's really just to quickly manage it and so that you can get an overview of what's going on because there's no UI way to do this. So you'd either have to connect with PowerShell or go through the rest of API. Um, going back to the presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what is a remote event receiver. So essentially what it is, uh, in this case, the, the whole demo is focused on remote event receivers on lists. They do exist in other parts of the platform as well. Um, there are a way to, to listen for events or get a trigger when something happens. So for instance, when an item is created in a SharePoint list, you can trigger a Azure function or really whatever. You can you can host it in on any web server. Um, you can then use that to write data back to the, to the list. So you could do some kind of advanced uh, calculated fields, or you could potentially do, like we saw just saw before, you can do verification. Uh, so you can actually use, for instance, two fields and generate a unique primary key across two fields to so say you can't have these two fields be identical with another list item. Um, you can also, because we're in a, a web server and we have code, you can do really whatever you want. So you could send the data to an external service. Say you're doing your own audit log on some other system, uh, or you could go ahead and get data from another service and write that back to the list uh, in case you're doing integrations to perhaps a uh, time tracking system or something. So that's all really cool, but a lot of this can actually be done using Power Automate. So when would you want to use, when would you want to use that instead? Because I mean, obviously Power Automate is, is always preferred and using Power Automate, we can easily do this thing where something changes. Okay, a Power Automate script or Power Automate flow, I think they're called, does something. Um, and writes that back to the list. But one of the use cases where I at least often feel that Power Automate really is not that awesome is say you have the six identical lists or 20 because you're using provisioning to, to roll out these lists. You're suddenly very limited in what you can do in, in Power Automate. Um, I've recently seen some, some really cool blog posts of people actually writing Power Automate scripts that can run across flows that can run across a large amount of lists, but you always end up using a lot of, of 
I don't want to say hacks, but you end up customizing the the Power Automate to a point where it's no longer a, a power user tool; it's almost a developer tool. Um, and in that in that case, I generally would prefer actually using a remote event receiver. Again, in this case, I'm just using an Azure Function logo because it's something hosted in the cloud. Uh, and you you can do this whole thing where instead of having one list, you can actually have six or seven lists or twenty if you want. So so you're suddenly able to to you do the same thing, but across a lot of lists. So so what are some of the the pros and cons of this? Um, I mean, a huge pro is is the reusability. You can actually go ahead and use it across many lists. Also, this whole synchronous and asynchronous thing. So so using Power Automate, we can't actually block a user from creating a list item. We could potentially delete it afterwards if it's not an allowed operation. But th this whole having custom error messages um, to tell the, the the user what you're entering currently is invalid and not allowed, and just stopping them from creating that that's a really powerful tool. It's something that's been in the platform for, a, as far as I know, a very long time. Uh, but just you don't really see it used all that often anymore. Um, I didn't even know it supported modern UI until I, I tested it out for this demo. But also the whole aspect of them actually running. I, I say instantly, but say you're running the uh, asynchronous one, it, it happens really fast. It's not not the five minute trigger you have on a flow. And I believe webhooks also have a five minute trigger ish. So, so this really snappy performance you can actually get. Also, we get, I, I put in quotes, uh, unlimited power. Because we're running back end code, we're able to, to use things like C some more the PNP framework. So, so we can really do do very powerful things. We can do third-party integrations that don't necessarily work that well with Flow, um, and we don't need a premium license to make an HTTP request uh, to some platform, which might even not even support REST, and you might have to do other things. So some of the downsides are it uses code, which means we're no longer in the power user suite of things, where Power Automate, you can teach a user how to, to build their own and how to maintain it. So that, that's kind of a problem that you're really stuck with code that needs to be compiled and hosted somewhere. And that's the other thing. You need to host this somewhere, and you can host it in Azure, and that works. But sometimes when you're working with a client, it can be kind of a thing where you're like, oh, I need an Azure subscription. It's not going to cost that much, but we need to host it there. And, and the client will be, will be like, but I don't want to pay a, an extra subscription. I already have Power Automate. Why can't we use that? So, so that's sometimes a bit, bit of a hassle. Then they're, they're harder to, to see, put in quotes again. So, so one of the things I've had sometimes is if um, you're helping a new client who already has an existing setup that some other developers worked on, there, there might actually be a remote event receivers there, but you don't really have an overview, overview of what's going on. Uh, this is also where the sample can be used because you can actually click in, you can see which remote event receivers on which lists. But that also leads into the, the black box aspect of it. So we have some code running somewhere in the cloud, but we don't know what it does. Uh, there, there's no easy way to, to see the code. You can't actually see it because it can be hosted on any environment. Um, so, so we don't know what, what does this do. We can, I mean, we can create a list item, we can see what happens, but does it do other things? That's really hard to tell. Whereas with the flow, you can open it up, you can look at it. Another thing that we get is, is the retry logic and handle logging from uh, Power Automate, where we get this really nice overview of when has this Power Automate run? Did it fail? Did it go well? Um, we don't really get that with the remote event receivers. They're kind of fire and forget. Uh, so if it fails, it fails. Uh, you, you can obviously use application insights to have a look at if your job failed or not. Um, so, so another thing you could do is using uh, queues, and you can actually Whenever the remote event receiver triggers, you can write your queue instead of just executing your code and saying, OK, I'm done. So there's definitely some pros and cons for both. Um, and, and generally, I think you should try to prefer Power Automate because it is more maintainable. It is more of a, I don't know what you say, so supported uh, feature set. It, feel, it feels more native to the platform, and you don't need to do custom code, which, I mean, we're all, some of us are developers, we love coding, but we also need to, to try and use the, the tools that we get from the, from the Microsoft team.
And that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Cool. Really, really good uh, summary, Dan. And, and there was a question related on deprecation plans on the remote events receivers, and there's no explicit ones as such. It is an older technology, uh, which we introduced many, many, many years ago before Craft even existed, uh, but it does work. Um, the really the challenge there is that, the, like Dan noted out, is, is the, re, uh, the retry logic. So if there would be a needed network disconnectivity between SharePoint Online and Azure or whatever, um, then there would not be a failure handling or an exception hunting on that. But really cool summary. Thank you, Dan, on that. Thank you.